So, the last are the best, or something like that. Um, our next uh, speaker is here waiting for this massive crowd uh, that will support him to go through his experience with the FBI. He's going to share with us um, the way he uh, informs the FBI about his behaviors. So it's not just uh, like in cycling or other sports, but I don't know what sport you do, Hassan. But he's, uh, he's a sportsman in communication with the FBI. Please give a welcome applause. <laughs> yes. Last are the best. That, oh, that's, I'm sorry. So it's pointing to me. The, the arrow will start making sense. Really, I mean, how amazing has it been the last few days here, right? It's been this in amazingly intense last few days, and it's kind of, you know, it's, it's an honor to kind of wrap this up. Uh, and I really appreciate you guys hanging out here till the very, very, very last time slot. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This is, it means a lot. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about this Congress for many years, and this is my first time here. And uh, it's just, you know, I was just telling some friends that I consider myself relatively tech literate, and then I come here and I feel like everyone's speaking a completely different foreign language that I have no idea what's happening. Uh, and it's not because some of the talks are in German. It's like literally like the, some of the subject matter is so specific that it's so easy to be completely like what is being discussed. Uh, so I'm going to tell you what something is a little bit more, you know, a little, a little bit more of a story and uh, kind of tell you about what I've been doing. So I'm an artist and... I get called all sorts of different things. I get, you know, sometimes I get lumped in with the media artists, sometimes with the sculptors, sometimes with photographers, sometimes I get called a con artist. But uh, so, uh, you know, so it's it's kind of odd being in this being in this uh, gatherings, particularly after some of the other talks that I've been sitting in on, but uh, tell, uh, let me tell you a little bit about how this thing came about, this thing with the arrow. By the way, uh, I'm at uh, elahi.org or elahi.umd.edu. I'll show you some of my works, but mainly I'll be focusing on this one project, which is called Tracking Transients, which I started shortly after 9-11. So uh, let me just give you a live feed of what it looks like. So this is, this is it. So you can go on the web and you could uh, follow me at any given moment. And there's this pixel, this arrow that comes through, which is actually these days we're so used to seeing ourselves as pixels on a map. But this project was started uh, 2002, and back then, to see yourself as a pixel was just such an unusual thing. I mean, these days, we, you know, uh, these days you're driving down the road and there's that little icon on the GPS that tells you exactly where you are. Or, you know, the, I mean, like, you know, like when was the last time you bought one of those maps at the gas station and you opened it up? Do you remember that? I mean, we don't, I mean, it's like, it's like we just completely lost that. We, we don't even know how to fold a map back up anymore. You know, because back in the old days, you'd have to take out that map and you'd go, we're here. So you'd have to locate yourself to the geography within that map. These days, you take out that magic phone and you press that little button and you become the center of your own map and the map resizes to you. So the, the space of the, so looking at yourself as a digital space versus a physical space, you know, it's, it's a totally different concept that we're running into now. And for some reason, this looks like this got caught up over here. So let's give it another kick, and hopefully it'll, it'll kick in again. Okay, so that's, that's so this is, uh, this is where I started. So the project starts here, and, you know, and this goes through the cycles of everything that I eat, and you know, let's see what comes up after this. So you, know, you, can, you, you can probably see where this place is. You probably recognize that. So these are all the meals that I've been cooking at home, and uh, I photograph all of them. It's just kind of interesting, because now it's like it's so common on Instagram, it's like you know, people think, that, you know, well, why, why else would you be using Instagram other than po posting photos of your food? But uh, I, I, I help out the FBI with this, so I send this. So this was uh, on Friday, December 4th. This was at the corner of Santa Clara and 11th in uh, San Jose. I, I, got, I bought gas there. This is at the Guimet Airport in Busan. This is some tripe that I've cooked at home, because I really like tripe. Uh, this, is, this is actually the Barack Hussein Obama uh, school in Jakarta, Indonesia, March 1st. This is, at, uh, this is uh, 
Sorry, this is going so fast. So every few moments what I do is I take a photograph and I timestamp my life and I send it to the FBI. And uh, well, you know, it's, it's, and it's also kind of interesting because these days the project means something so different. When I first started this project, people would be like, oh no, 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 don't show up at my house. And now it's like, you know, it's now it's like if you're, don't, if you're not on social media, if you're not connected, like people think of you as some, some weirdo or something. Uh, so what happens here, is that this thing of like continuously, continuously um, monitoring myself and continuously checking in. You know, now a lot of people are like, I don't get this. This looks up my Instagram feed. What's the big deal? But then this concept of self-surveillance or this, or this watching ourselves or, or monitoring ourselves for the sake of someone else, whether it be your Twitter followers or in my case, the FBI, I mean, this is something that's become so commonplace and each of us are creating our own archives. So a lot of the shifts that's taking place culturally, I think is really important to, to think about this because you know, it's like, like this bed. I mean, you're not really sure what happened in that bed. You're not really sure who I was there with or you see these like random train stations. There, there are always these empty spaces. There's like, you know, no one's ever there. And, and every now and then you might see some people, but they just, they just tend to be incidental to the image, which is kind of interesting when you look at like the no photography or, the, or, or ask permission of people that are in there, which is really amazing to think about that, like how many cameras are, are there and they give them up. Actually, in this room right now, there are at least twice as many cameras as there are people because there's one camera in the front of your phone and another one in the back of your phone and who knows how many other cameras in, in the, all the other devices and everything else that are putting in. So we can't really escape these cameras regardless of what we do. And so all of these things, these are all these bits and pieces that I'm, that I'm uh, archiving of my life. So every few moments, another photo gets put up and it gets tagged with the geotag of where it was. Again, th this is something that's so common today, but. 12, 13, 14 years ago, this was completely just like, what are you doing and why are you doing this? And, sorry, so yeah, and then, then of course there's all these toilets because uh, my FBI agent really needs to know. I figured the FBI, you know, they want to know my business and I'm very open and I'm very sharing, so I figured I'm going to tell them every little bit of detail, including the toilets that I use and how frequently and where I go. Uh, you know, they, they, they need to know. So. Really what's happening, you know, and, and what, I'm really, what I'm really doing is, uh, I'm, it's, it's a matter of telling you everything and telling you absolutely nothing simultaneously. It's a barrage of noise. Look, I know that eventually, you know, machine and AI, machine readers and AI is going to get so, so sophisticated that at a certain point, the, this, this idea of overwhelming the system, it's not going to be possible. This is a temporary fix. And the reason I, cho I chose this fix is, uh, you know, obviously the FBI has a file on me. Uh, I, I, by the way, the, the background story of this is I got reported as a terrorist. Uh, the, you know, I guess I, pr I should probably explain that on, on that a little bit. So shortly after 9-11, my landlords uh, that I had this, I rented this uh, storage space from called the police and said that an Arab man had fled on September 12th who was hoarding explosives. Never mind, there were no explosives, never mind, it wasn't an Arab man, but you know, that Arab man would be me, even though I'm Bengali and we're actually not Arabs, but it doesn't matter because as far as many people, you know, they're all the same over there. They're all kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's that mentality. So I spent six months of my life with the FBI convincing them that I'm not a terrorist. And after all that, they said, okay, everything's great, you're fine. And I said, okay, wonderful, can I get a letter saying I'm fine? There's a little problem with that because uh, have you ever tried to get uh, something that says you're not guilty of something you never did? So, you know, so ever since then, I've, based, I've been with my FBI just like, hey, what do I do? I mean, I travel a lot. All we need is the next guy not to get the next memo and here we go all over again. How do I avoid this? So at that moment, he gave me a phone. He says, here's some phone numbers. If you get into trouble, give us a call. We'll take care of it. So ever since then, I would call my FBI agent, tell him where I was going, send him photos, do all of these things. And thus, that's what this whole project started. And, uh, I mean, back then when I started this project, shortly after 9-11, I mean, the, my phone was like those old, remember those old Nokia 6600s? It was like super chunky ones and you had to hit the buttons like a whole bunch of times to send like one text message across. I mean, we used to call them smartphones back then. I mean, they're really not that smart, but they're kind of smartphones. Anyway. So this process of like sending all this information to the FBI, I started telling them everything and also at the same time by telling them everything, I'm also telling them absolutely nothing. 
because it's just a wall of noise. And in that noise, there is some signal. And the ratio, the signal to noise ratio, is actually pretty skewed. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty out of sync in that sense because it's, it's difficult for the, for the viewer to know what they're looking at. So if you don't see the, the website, it's, uh, it's, it is an archaic website. I mean, it is completely obsolete technologically. But more importantly, it's also one of these things. It's, it's intentionally user unfriendly. It's not, you know, information is not categorized in a way where, you know, oh, I want to see this data this time. It's like, it's just, it just comes in at whichever way it, the, the algorithm these days feels like generating the, the info. So sometimes you might see a taco, then you might see the next one from Mexico City, then Mexico City might go to like this place and because I took a flight from there to Houston, so you might get some images from Houston next and then from Houston you might get some things from another city in the back and forth. So it actually takes all these pathways various uh, through it. So in this process, I'm really, you know, it's, it's, I'm telling you everything and nothing in this camouflage, in this, you know, thing of like, you know, historic camouflage. Now, the concept of camouflage, particularly in digital identity, is really important because historically when you hear camouflage, it's usually uh, meant for, you know, warfare, battle, soldiers. And the reason we have, uh, the reason camouflage looks a certain way is because it was designed to break the silhouette of the body of the soldier in the battlefield, in the landscape of warfare. So uh, this is why, you know, certain trees look certain colors and when you look, you know, it's every place you go, there's a different war. Uh, each, with each war, there's a different uh, pattern that, that's used. Now, if you look at the new camouflage that most troops are wearing, particularly in the US where I live, uh, it's all pixeled. It's all pixelized. You know, it's all, and it's all this like weirdly grayish, greenish color. I don't know if you've noticed that color, but there's no trees that color anywhere. It's because it's not meant for blending into the landscape anymore. It's no longer meant so the soldier has to blend into the battlefield. The reason it's pixelized and it's that grayish, greenish color is because we no longer have a need for the soldier to blend in to the battlefield, the physical battlefield, but what we want is the soldier to be, to, to, so the enemy cannot distinguish the physical body of the soldier in the noise in the night vision goggles. That's why it's that color. That's why it's that grayish green. So this is a huge step. So we no longer, it's no longer about the physical presence of the body in the, in the war field, in, the, in warfare, but it's now about, the, it's now where the, the digital body, the, the, the physical body is intentionally camouflaged and mistaken for digital artifact. It's that pixelization. That we've that we've forced uh, basically a warfare and a lot of work that I do with a lot of a lot of the art that I uh, come up with comes out of warfare and such and I'll, and I'll show you a little of the, but this is a really important piece that I wanted to talk to you about because this was taken from one of the earliest samples of what the U.S. Army uses and it was done at the at the base at Natick which is the in, outside of Boston this is where a lot of the camouflage in the U.S. is designed. It's the U.S. Army's fashion design department, though they would never call it the fashion design department, but this is where they design all the camouflage and the, and the outfits. And so this sample was taken, and at first it just looks like a modernist grid, uh, various photographs and such, but what they really are is I took the old sample and I blew it out and took out each pixel and replaced each pixel with a photograph of a historic or current point of conflict. So there's these two images right in the middle, if you look, uh, the, the two blue images over there, uh, kind of in the middle to the bottom, those are in North Korea. Those are on north of the 38th parallel. They're actually technically uh, north of the parallel, so you're actually in North Korean territory, but, the, there's, but at Panmunjom there's actually uh, six buildings, and, three of, and all six are built directly across the border, and you know, it's kind of uh, unpractical to share half the building with another country. So three of the buildings belong to South Korea, three of them belong to North Korea. So these are the South Korean buildings, but physically in North Korean territory. Similarly, like that plate of ham that you see right below it, you know, it's a Spanish ham, and being a good Muslim, I really do enjoy my Spanish ham. But uh, this was, this was uh, photographed in Guernica, the site of a brutal massacre. Uh, shortly, you know, so similarly, so each of the, every single one of these images, they might seem like these 
generic or bland image, but they're all historic conflicts or current conflicts. There's, a, there's an image in the, in the upper right hand, um, in the upper left hand corner right there. Uh, and it's, it's of, an, of an office building with just a, 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 a flag with three stripes going across. Uh, and uh, this is like a quick world affairs quiz. Which country has a, has a flag that goes three horizontal stripes across, the top and bottom are red, and the middle one is green? Any guesses on this country? Three stripes, red, green, red. Uh, lots of confused looks, huh? It, it's, it's a trick question, the country doesn't exist. It's, uh, it's Transnistria, or at least the Russians call it Pridnistrovia. And uh, it's a breakaway republic of Moldova. It's a tiny little sliver of land between Moldova and Ukraine, maybe about 20, 30 kilometers wide and maybe about 200 kilometers long. This tiny, tiny, tiny sliver. No one, they have, well, by the way, they have their own military, they have their own passports, they have their own currency, they have their own judicial system. They have their own everything like a country except no one recognizes them as a country. Uh, but you need to go by 20 cases of AK-47s. This is the place to go. So this is this tiny piece of land, this tiny piece of land that no one recognizes is really where a lot of the destabilization of the world comes from. Uh, so I went over there, and then of course I would tell my FBI agent this is where I was going, just loitering. And he'd be like, what are you doing over there? It's like, I'm just hanging out, just seeing what's going on. Anyway. So again, all of the, every single one of these images, there's a bits and pieces of these types of, of stories. But I want, to, I want to go back to this thing of warfare and uh, talk to you a little bit about that. So I live in the U.S. and uh, you know, it's, we're you know, currently at the War on Terror. Actually, the, the real name is the Global War on Terror. And this was a drawing that I did for a project a few years ago. And uh, there's, a, there's a congressional document, so there's this document that the U.S. Congress uh, keeps, and it's called the Instances of Use of United States Armed Forces Abroad. Oh, at this time, it was 1798 to 2006. This gets updated every year. And uh, interestingly enough, when you look at this document, it's, everything is just the facts. Everything is, you know, in 1838, you know, Marines chased pirates onto a Caribbean island. Well, when the Marines landed on that Caribbean island, we invaded that country. Anytime you send your troops onto another country's soil without that country's permission, you have invaded that country. Uh, so everything from like, you know, Marines chasing pirates to a Caribbean island all the way to World War I. It's all just one, everything's just listed as one instance, just straight down. Like, and this, and this just goes on for pages and pages and pages and pages and pages. And, you know, so, and then you look at it you're like, wait, when, when, did, when did the U.S. invade Florida? Well, that was when it was Spanish territory. This was, uh, you know, before that became part of the United States. Similarly, you know, so when you look at it, all the white X's are all the invasions that the U.S. has uh, undertaken between 1776, which was the year of the independence, to World War I. All the gray X's are World War I to Vietnam, and all the black X's are Vietnam to today. The number of invasions that the U.S. troops have uh, undertaken between 1776 and World War I roughly equate the same amount as World War, as World War I to Vietnam, and the number of invasions from, uh, from 1776 to Vietnam roughly equate Vietnam to today. In the last 100 years, in the last 117 years, since, since 1900, there's only been five years where the U.S. has not been at war. Interestingly enough, we've only declared war 11 times in history. Since independence of the country, the U.S. has only formally declared war 11 times. Yet, of the, all the years that we've ever been an independent country, like, there's only like 20 or 30 years that we haven't been at war. And most of those are, are pre-1800. Uh, and, then, and then, so since 1900, uh, there's only been five years. And you can see all of these dots. So uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to create this document is that I had this uh, proposal that I wanted to do for this, uh, this museum in Spain. And uh, I was talking to the curator and I said, hey, you know, it would be really great. What if we uh, set up a wall of like bulletproof glass in, in the gallery? So we'll just, you know, it's like as people are going around the museum, we'll just set up a huge bulletproof, a huge sheet of bulletproof glass 
we'll have a real faint drawing of, of the world and we'll have, gu- we'll have a guy with a rifle in the back and he'll shoot bullets at the audience but, the, but because there's bulletproof glass, it'll stop. And I, I mean, I knew that there was just no way they would go for it but to my surprise, they said, let us talk to some so our security people and uh, we'll get back to you about this. And I was really surprised. So in the meantime, we did some ballistics tests. So check this out, look at, look at I mean, like, that's, that's what it looks like. I mean, it's just beautiful when, I mean, just the way, like when, 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 basically when bullets hit bulletproof glass, it's not really glass, it's just very dense plastic. And the heat of the bullet comes in at such, such velocity that the plastic melts just ever so slightly and then just swallows the bullet back up and it freezes back up. So it slightly liquefies and then solidifies. This is what happens inside your body when you get shot, except your body doesn't just you know, absorb the bullet and just refreeze together. It's just like this really scary looking thing of just looking at that, that blunt trauma, that, that immediate point of when that bullet hits. This is what happens. So we did some ballistics tests and uh, we went through some ideas and then, and then of course as I expected, they said, no, you're crazy, there's no way we're doing this. But they were willing to send this out to an to a off-site and we built this in a, in a, these fabricators built this off-site. And uh, of course then there was these other problems of, you know, if we build this in the US, and send it to the museum, I mean, uh, you know, when it comes into Europe, does it get imported as artwork or does it get imported as, well, possibly firearms because there's actual real gunpowder in it? Uh, there's a lot of problems. So in order to deal with the, 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 uh, the customs issues of it, we figured, you know what, let's, let's just ship it, let's just have it built in, in Spain. And then as we were about to build this, we realized there was a little pesky Spanish law that requires you to be at least 25 meters away from the intended target. You can't discharge a weapon in less than 25 meters of its intended target. Now, of course, I wanted this piece to be gigantic and then you could only imagine the, the, the price of the bulletproof glass as it gets larger and larger and larger. So we eventually agreed that it'll be four meters by two meters. Except at that scale, each of these dots, each of these, bu- each of these targets then become like three millimeters or four millimeters in diameter. Now, I don't know how many of you do shooting or target practice or any of that, but try to hit 330 dots that are about three to four millimeters in diameter from 25 meters away, one after another without missing them. That's actually practically impossible. Uh, So I was like, how do we do this? And then the museum fortunately hired three former Olympians to do this. And it was just unbelievable watching these guys. And of the 330 bullets that are there, 326 of them were exactly on center. The four that were off were no more than five, five millimeters. And I'm convinced I just drew them wrong. Those four, uh, I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. But you, but you can see what happened. So in the middle over here, this is Central America. We have hit, we have invaded Central America so many times that as you keep hitting these bullets, these physical uh, these bullets just eventually the bulletproof glass just shatters and gives way. I mean, it's a, it causes a literal wreck. So it's kind of interesting looking at this the, this very abstract concept of of these invasions, these political uh, um, the, these types of political policies that we have, and what the physical manifestation of that, what that does in a map. But what does that do to the physical geography? So I'm really interested in this idea of geography, body, data, body this physicality and the virtuality and how these two come together in this. So similarly, uh, I've been been doing a lot of these things about warfare and such, and I want to show you this project. This is a project that I've been working on in uh, in Hawaii recently. And, you know, Hawaii, I mean, who's going to turn down a job in Hawaii? It was pretty unbelievable getting getting a chance to do this project. And uh, so... When you go to, when you in, when you go, and Hawaii is a really interesting, uh, at least in American uh, policy and American uh, political and cultural uh, perspectives, Hawaii is a very unique place because Hawaii is the ultimate uh, manifestation or the ultimate like embodiment of what we in in the in the U.S. we have this term called manifest destiny, 
which was a term from the early 1700s, actually from the uh, late 1700s, from the early uh, history of, of America, where we decided to start in the East and the Atlantic and expand all the way across, the, the, that we will manif the, manifest the country and the whole t land will be, become ours. So this is the birth of, of the US. This is the idea of how the, the country was, was given birth to. Now, Hawaii is a really interesting uh, it, 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 uh, situation in this perspective because now, you know, we've started on the Atlantic coast, we've, we've conquered, 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 got, went all the way to the wind. We've gone to the Pacific Ocean, and now we've crossed the Pacific Ocean, and now we've gone to this middle of this, this rock in the middle of the, of the ocean, and now we're at the top of the mountain. So we've actually, like, you know, like gone all the way. Out. And the interesting thing is Hawaiian culture, when you go to the peaks of each of the mountains, every, every of the mountain peaks are sacred. Interestingly enough, when you go to each of these mountaintops, they're all, well, they're almost always US military or some sort of government or some sort of science, but of course for many, and now granted there is some amazing stuff being done, but there is a lot of also very shady, you know, like military stuff being done. And it's also this thing of like going up and then now we have these surveillance devices, these telescopes at the top of each of these monitoring and surveying and measuring everything out in the west and out, out in, in, in the sky. And you know, so we've gone through the west, which is also a really interesting thing about the history of landscape in America. Let me show you, let me show you a couple of these images uh, of, what, of the, the top of this place, which is just, it's just beautiful going up there. I mean, it, it looks like Mars. And a lot of the Mars tests were actually done up there because it's, I mean, it's, it's just amazing. Like you're looking down at the sky and there's these like satellites everywhere. I mean, it really does look like a Martian landscape. So I'm really interested in this. Okay, so let me show you this project. So I've been really interested in watching the watchers of this thing of like, uh, and, uh, and what happens when you aestheticize surveillance. I mean, obviously this is a major issue for a lot of us, and, and a lot of the uh, conference topics here talks about privacy and what to do and how to, how to stop mass, uh, mass surveillance and things of that type. But when you hear the word surveillance imagery, what do you think of? What are you thinking? Just imagine, the picture surveillance imagery. What does it look like to you? And for most of us, we generally probably think of like, you know, like what CCTV or surveillance camera images look like. Usually grainy, pixely, you know, gritty, sometimes black and white. Uh, you know, with this audience, we already know data storage is cheap. I mean, this data storage, I mean, you could buy a terabyte drive for like 30 bucks. So data, you know, it's, and, and it gets cheaper and cheaper every day and the capacity gets larger and larger. So it's not necessarily an economic issue, but it's actually more of a cultural issue. And I'm, and, and, and I'm proposing the fact that when you hyper aestheticize a surveillance image, your brain no longer reads it as surveillance. Your brain rejects the image when it's too aesthetically pleasing. You read it as landscape, or you read it as, you read it as landscape photography, and in, many of the, in the case of landscape photography, many of it is, the history of it is based on landscape painting. So it's really that, that gritty graininess that, that actually gives us the, the, the emotional attachment that this is a surveillance image. Because when it becomes, when it doesn't have those characteristics, when it doesn't have those qualities, it becomes a, a photo or a video. So in this case, I, just, I was really interested in what happens when, when you hyper aestheticize that. And uh, imagine if you had x-ray vision. Imagine if you had x-ray vision, you could see right through this wall. What would you see on the other side of this wall? Well, this image, which actually looks like a window pane, they're actually six very large monitors. And this, is, this functions as a, as a, as a see-through wall. So you could actually see through this wall. And just so ha it just so happened that on the other side of the, of the wall from this uh, exhibition space was the Baltimore Police Department. So I love the idea of being able to watch the police, watching me, watching them. And then you notice that there's that, uh, next to the blue light, there's a little surveillance camera on top of their dumpster which really doesn't make any sense to me why they would need a surveillance camera over their dumpster. But I just love this image of just this constant reflecting back and forth and watching and watching and watching back. And in the image, you couldn't tell, you know, whether it was, whether you're looking at a photograph or whether you're looking at a video or whether you're, you know, it's just every now and then you see some blurry lights move by or some of these figures. But really, you know, if you look at a lot of what machine vision a lot of the software, I mean, you know, like, you know, you see those things on the, on the TV with all those people looking at those monitors. And the, 
that's no, that stuff, that's like the movies, or that's like the use for like fundraising. The real stuff is all machines looking at this stuff, and it doesn't actually look that sexy at all. So, I love this idea of actually taking this image and you know seeing what what can, what happens when it's when it's aestheticized. Now, similarly, you know what happens when the form is aestheticized. This is the the very similar project at, at another location, uh, but this is what you would see through the wall. And when you see this, I mean, your brain completely rejects this as a surveillance image. But this is exactly what happens right on the other side over there. So thinking about the idea of aesthetics and what surveillance looks like, and at least, you know, growing up in, in, the, in, the, in an American context, uh, you know, so a lot of the history of American photography comes from American painting or landscape painting. And the history of a lot of our landscape painting comes from the Hudson River School, uh, which is the northeast and you know, up, up north of New York City and up, up the Hudson River. These gorgeous grand vistas, often of these really large, you know, wide viewpoints of these uh, very like subliminal, very like spiritual type of imagery. This very godlike imagery, which is kind of interesting because in a way it is like trying to replicate this eye of God or if you want to look at it from the perspective of surveillance, in which we generally tend to think of surveillance as a very post-9-11 or a very 21st century concept. I mean, most of us did not use the word surveillance, say, uh, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. That word was not as common. It certainly has become incredibly common in our vocabulary very recently. But even though we tend to think of surveillance as a very post uh, tw a very 21st century concept. This is something that's been embedded in our history and our brains for thousands of years, particularly when you look at those early paintings and then God as the original surveillance camera. You behaved because God was watching. So it was very easy to replace this being above with a camera above, and that becomes so normalized in our daily lives. I mean, think about it. How does Santa Claus know everything about you? I mean, we, we're taught this since we're at such an early point in life. We've, so this normalization of surveillance, this normalization, and also this, you know, and you know, we, we, we don't think, of, we never use the word surveillance when we're talking about God. Again, you know, this aesthetic, the, the, the hyper-aestheticization, or maybe if you want to call, I mean, this is not exactly aestheticization, but, it, you know, uh, I, in the idea of thinking about it. So, again, this relationship between the watched and watcher, and, you know, another similar project of what it, lo what it looks like when, when you break that frame of looking at uh, of, of the, the format of, of surveillance, and when you aestheticize the format, not only the imagery of surveillance, but also the format and how the surveillance is presented. Uh, I mean, we rarely, we would never, we wouldn't even think of this as a surveillance camera image, but that is exactly what this is. It's another similar piece. Uh, I just want to show you the context of this one because I want to show you, uh, talk a little bit about the project that's going on on the right. And this image is, uh, so they, they look like these landmines, but they also look like satellites. I'm really interested in this idea of like circumnavigation. I'm really interested in these things of, uh, you know, it, conceptually, um, this, this project I was telling you earlier about, this is about telling you everything and nothing simultaneously. But in a similar way, I'm also really interested in this concept of Magellan and circumnavigation, where you go far enough to this side, you end up in the other, you circle around the whole thing. Does that make sense in a little bit? So, you know, sometimes some people are so far to the left that they're actually very much to the right and vice versa. So there's this, this, this circular reasoning that keeps coming back and forth. And I'm really interested in this thing of, this could, this could be a landmine, but this could also be a satellite. It's, there's these types, and then also at the same time, like this, was, this is an earlier project, but uh, they also look like selfie sticks. But then there's these, like, all these things coming out with these, like, these monitors sticking out of each of them. This is pre-iPad. Well, actually, this installation was done later, but... I mean, now it's like these tablets are like so common and they're so everywhere. But with these are 72 monitors and all the images that I've shared with the FBI and sent to my FBI agent, these are all being shown on all these monitors simultaneously and you could get the idea of what you're looking at. Uh, so, in the same sense, uh, this project was, uh, this is only a part of this one. This one's, uh, this one's uh, about, it's about 28 feet, so that's, uh, well, this is about eight meters, eight and a half meters tall. 
this piece, and uh, it's basically every photo that I photo that I photographed and shared, but they're all printed in these huge pieces and these huge vinyl banners, and the actual photos, each photo is about this little, but you know there's like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of them. So when you look from the back, all you see is these vertical color stripes. Interestingly enough, well, what the the other thing that I, I don't necessarily disclose this in public and at the piece, but you're really looking at all the images shot on Sunday, all the ones on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so on, with the seven days. But what's also happening is, you know, the the color bars, the test bars for color calibration of monitors. You know, it's like so. One of the things that would happen, um, I'm, I'm sure you must have had, I must, I'm sure you must have had this in Germany, uh, but in the U.S. we we used to have a thing called the, the emergency broadcast system. And the television show would stop and it would go, Dee! this tone would come out and these color bars would come on the screen and it would say, this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Had this been a real emergency, you would have been instructed on what to do. So this thing of impending doom, this thing of something, is, something bad is about to happen or something bad could happen and because something like that could happen, we need to be ready and we need to be prepared. This thing of like, you know, being ready for these things. So I'm really interested in that and this idea of like, what happens when you, when you use that tone or when you use that color or when you borrow that thing. But at the same time, it's the very same system that broadcasters use to calibrate signal. So this thing of signal, you know, and, and if you think about it on a, on a daily basis, we generate so much digital information, how much of it can be, how do we calibrate that? So, so in a way of giving a nod to that, that's where this piece comes out of. So, and then this one led to the next one which, and this has been making the rounds throughout the place. So this was at ZKM uh, in a couple of years ago here, and then now this has been floating around Eastern Europe. And these are, you know, they look really small on the, in the photograph, but this is the same piece, but lit up from the back. Uh, I'll, I'll show you another photo of it so you can get a better idea of, of, of this piece. So, you know, you're seeing every little bit, bit and pieces and all of these things coming together. So they're, they're about three meters tall, each of these slabs, and, and, uh, and, they, and they lit up from the back. So. And, and then this is a body of work that I've been dealing with. So this thing of like, you know, libraries or archives, and we, we all have them. We all create personal archives. I mean, if you look at every single photo you've ever shot, I mean, which you probably have a record of, uh, you know, so when you have all of these, so what, you know, so we, we're all keeping our own private archives. You know, I have my own private archive that I'm doing as a parallel archive to the FBI. But, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be for the FBI. I mean, we all, I mean, well, maybe, in, in this room, I'm sure everybody here has been watched by the government at this, and there's probably a few people from, from the shady organizations in this room right here anyway, or certainly at the conference. But what you're looking at here is every, every, uh, every one of those images, and then there's this gritty, grainy, black and white image uh, on top, and it looks like every other industrial rooftop. It looks like it's a rooftop of a building. And you can see the, the fans and the exhaust and the vents. And then on the lower right, there's these like golf ball looking things. And most buildings don't have those. This happens to be the rooftop of the NSA. This is, this is, so, so really, you know, and I kind of look at it, it's like the NSA and, and, you know, us, we're kind of in the same business. We're kind of all in the information business. Except, you know, they like to keep theirs to themselves and I like to like give it out to everybody. So, you know, we, we, we operate a little differently in our business, but we're kind of in the same business. So I decided to put this piece out and really this thing of like, you know, so in a, in a lot of ways, they're kind of like selfies, but they're not really selfies because when I photograph these things, so let's go back to this for now. So, you know, when I'm photographing this, I mean, I, I could have taken the camera and I could have photographed you right now, but instead there's this very anonymous looking thing. I mean, like, you know, if you've been in this, if you've been in this room, you know that this could, we know where that is. But in the same way, there's these like really like, you know, so the camera's not pointing towards me, but the camera's pointing outward. And that's what's really important here. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands of these. Uh, and, you know, so the selfies, it's become a common thing, and it's, it's no shame in, 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 in you know, saying you like the selfies. I mean, here's uh, President Obama trying to make the look a selfie stick, and selfies look uh, pretty respectable. I, I, I can't use the new guy. I can't, I can't just bear to see him, so I have to go with this guy. I have to go with Obama, because uh, you know, it's important. Uh, but you know, he's, he's making that, so when he's taking that image, what happens? Now, when you look at the image, this is, what, this is, this is the image that we're seeing. That's, that's up on my website right now, and as soon as I leave this room, there'll be a new image that'll pop up, and then when I get to my hotel, you'll see another image, and then when I get to you know, the, wherever I go eat tonight, you'll see another image. But anyway, so you know, every few moments, I, I, I timestamp and change it. So when we're seeing this image, 
But really, this is what the, this is what the computer is seeing. It's, and and this, some of you, and I'm sure you know about this, but uh, for those that are not aware of it, I mean, you know, when you look at the XF data, I use a Coradoco, which is an XF reader, to, to extract what my images are, with the data that's behind it. So you can see where the image is uh, that was shot right there in, in that location. I mean, we know that because that's how our apps know, would you like to check in from here? That's how it knows the location. So location services, that's pretty simple. And that's all the, the metadata that's going. But here's where it gets really interesting. The fact that when you look at the, the altitude of this image, the, uh, the altitude is 186.061643. Rough sounds about right for Leipzig, for this area, 186 meters of altitude. Yes, no? I mean, I'm assuming it's correct because that's what the phone's telling me. But similarly, what's really interesting is when you look at the image direction, so, I mean, we know the latitude and longitude, that's a given, the altitude, that's a new one, because an image taken on, the, on sea level, at the ground level, will look very different than an image shot on the 20th or 30th floor of a building, because the barometric sensor inside the phone will put a different altitude number in there. So we know that this image can only, so if I were to shot, shoot this image from the roof, looking down, that image probably will be about 188, 189, 190 meters because of the distance of this. The other part that's really interesting is the image uh, direction. The camera was tilted at 163 degrees from north, zero being north, 90 east, 180 south, 270 west. So it was slightly south, the camera was pointed slightly south-ish, which is exactly what that camera is pointed. Now, why does this matter? It was only a few years ago that we were thinking, you mean Google is going to drive up and down every single road and record every single street? Yes. B basically, the only thing that's holding them back in certain places is the country's laws or the, or the local things. Aside from that, not only they drive up and down every single road in every single city and every single country that they can, they do this repeatedly year after year after year after year after year. Some places they'll, they'll put, you know, like in Venice, they'll have like a, someone on a boat that goes through. On certain pedestrian-only islands, there'll be someone carrying a backpack of those Google cameras around. So it wasn't that long ago that this concept that Google would catalog every possible outdoor space was seen so far-fetched. It's only a matter of time before we collectively photograph every indoor space and we catalog every single indoor space and we photograph all of it. And sooner or later, this database, we, through this database of every indoor image with all the metadata, we can restitch every in interior space. We can recreate every interior space. Similarly, you know, then, you know, you, when you look at your frequent locations, I mean, you know, you look at, you know, it's like, you know exactly what moment you've come on, you mo what minute you've walked into a place, what minute you've walked out of a place. I mean, you know, how, how does your phone know that you've taken, you know, 8,934 steps today? I mean, it's counting every single one of them. It knows you went three, you know, it, it, you've done five fli flights today because it knows that your altitude changed from here to here to here. And it knows every second you've done all this. I mean, this is, this is kind of crazy. So, you know, you, you cross-reference all of this data. I mean, and, and short of basically giving up our phones, I mean, this data is being collected. And it's going to happen. It's going to get uh, archived. I mean, you know, there's plenty of you that you know that these ca that these phones are just like in it's inevitable. I mean, we're not going to give up our lives without them. So you cross-reference all of these, and we very quickly it creates a complete picture of the owner of that device. Now. Back in the old days, you know, you'd have to, you know, the intelligence agencies would waste all of this energy and you know, follow people around. I mean, you know, it wasn't that long ago it happened right here. I mean, you'd have people following other people around. You'd have databases and you'd have archives on other archives. This record keeping, this massive amount of analog record keeping was not, you know, this is not far-fetched. This happened very recently. Now, why should, why should they go around doing that today when they can just go to one of the companies and say, hey, you know, why don't you give us this? Now, we know, you know, of course, here's uh, you know, Tim Cook saying, no, 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 we don't, we don't give our information to the NSA. We don't do that. 
uh, we know a little differently, you know? I mean, remember these? These are from Snowden. I mean, this is obvious. And look, it doesn't say when we, when, it does not say when the NSA intercepted each of these dates when PRISM collection began for each provider. They're, they're being called providers here. The reason they're being called providers is because these are the companies that are providing the information to the NSA. So while Tim Cook can say that he doesn't, you know, while, while, he, can say, while he can say all he wants about he doesn't, you know, that, that they don't involve themselves, we know otherwise. We, this is proof. So, you know, so my whole thing is like, hey, you know, if, if, if the tech companies, if these, if these large multinational tech companies can provide this information, why can't we do this for ourselves? Why can't we just put this out there? And, wh and why not just put everything out there, whether it's relevant or not? Uh, and why not just mud up the whole system? So, you know, I'm really interested in this idea of like creating our own archives. Do you know this building? This is the AT&T data center in San Francisco at the corner of 2nd and Folsom. This is a project that they call Hawkeye, which is actually AT&T's internal code name for this data center. And uh, shortly before 2007, about a little over 10 years ago, there were, uh, there was a whistleblower the, with the, that came forward. It was in room 641A of this building, which uh, basically what happened is the NSA approached 16 telecom companies in the US and said, we'd like to copy your data stream. And 15 of the 16 said, sure, help yourself. You know, make yourself at home. There's only one company that said, you know, we're not really sure of the legalities of this. Can you come back with a warrant and tell us what you're looking for? And we will, we will provide it to you if you can tell us what you want. Uh, but, but, you know, you had, you had 15 of the 16 just say, yeah, go help, go ahead. So what, what basically what happened in, in 2007, not, you know, like who knows what it is now, but in 2007, it was estimated that there was uh, 213 terabytes of uh, phone records in this building. Uh, every phone record of every domestic call in the US was, was uh, archived. And then of course there's multiple data centers. This is just one of many. Now, who does that phone call belong to? You know, when you're calling grandma, does that phone call, does that information in that phone call, does that belong to you? Does that belong to grandma or does that belong to the phone company and they're licensing you a one-time use of it? We don't, I mean, again, this, who actually owns this data? So I was really interested in this and, you know, and, and keeping a record. So I know, you know while AT&T is keeping records, which is my, uh, my, my mobile phone provider in the US, similarly, I'm, I'm keeping my own records and this is all my, uh, this is my log files of all the people that come by on my website. And you can see all of the folks. Let me show you a little bit cleaner version. And you can see all the, all the lovely, happy people that come by, like the Terrorist Screening Center, or the Central Intelligence Agency, or the, uh, you know, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. I don't know why they come by. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that they like art. I'm glad we have patrons of the arts in, uh, in these organizations. Uh, because, you know, I mean, like, they come by frequently enough. I'm not really sure what they're doing, but I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad they like what I do. But so I really have to thank uh, one particular person for making my art career possible, and that would be Dick Cheney. And because if it was not for Dick Cheney, uh, I would not be here talking to you. None of this would be possible without Dick Cheney. I mean, really, I mean, you know, he's, he's really responsible for a lot of things that have happened recently. Uh, so thank you, Dick Cheney, if you're, if you're listening, which you probably are because you know everything and you are, you know, you, you have your people. Anyway, so a few years ago, uh, I, well, about uh, 2010, I moved to the, I, I, started, I took a job at the University of Maryland, which is in College Park. And when I say Maryland, most people assume we're in Baltimore because that's the main city in Maryland, but we're actually closer to Washington, D.C. So you can see, so there's College Park. That's, that's where I work. This is the FBI headquarters. This is the CIA. This is the NSA. You triangulate the three, it ends up on my campus. So it's only appropriate, you know, it's, and plus, you know, we have this budget problem in the U.S. right now, so I'm like helping them out. It's like, you know, guys, can I help you guys, can I help you out by moving in like right next to you so you don't have to waste your resources? By the way, Vice.com ranked us the most militarized university in America. We're number one of them. We're not number one in football or anything. It takes a while for that sort of stuff, but most militarized, that's pretty easy. We can do that. Let me show you a little bit about it. So it's an amazing place. So D.C. is, Washington, D.C. is a great place to be. Problem is real estate is really, really, really expensive. Like housing is really, you know, it's a company town. I mean, like why else would you need to live there unless you know you're working in government? 
So while you know, real estate prices in other parts of the country go up and down, Washington just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. So you know, it's been good, but then I found this piece of land in St. Michael's. Now if you look over here, it says the average listing price in the zip code, which is the, the postal code in that area, is $797,303. This was back in 2010. Uh, you know, $800,000 at that time, the average. And then I found this piece of land for only 74,000 bucks. I was like, I want this. I want this, I want this. I'm gonna, you know, it's like I need to do something. And it's about an hour and a half away from work, which is a little bit, but you know, it's possible. Anyway, so this is where the house is over there. It goes further up, so it's a piece of land. It's, it's a beautiful place. I mean, you see the nature and all that. It's that weird oblong shape over there. And you see that little uh, driveway with, that, with nice trees with that house in the water? That belongs to this guy. So, and let me take you around the neighborhood for a little bit. So this is, this is uh, his, uh, his uh, gate. This is his driveway. He drives up this way. Uh, he, he has a five car garage. Two of those garages go back pretty deep. This is a swimming pool. We're gonna hang out here over the summers. Hang out, you know, we're gonna throw some parties. This is his uh, front room. Uh, this is his kitchen. This is where he sleeps. And uh, this is where we're gonna plot world domination. We're gonna hang out and eat yellow cake up there. Uh, so this is the place. I'm, I'm hoping to build this. This is what I was trying to build, but the listing just kind of disappeared. It literally just disappeared. And I'm, I'm convinced it's, you know, it's like he kind of does that to people too. I'm glad he just did it to the listing and not to me. But, you know, it wasn't withdrawn, it wasn't sold, it just like disappeared. So these days it's become like this really conceptual project where I'm actually painting them and then I'm photographing the paintings. So this is what I'm actually showing. So, you know, it's, it's so, okay, here's my thing. So look. Here's a man, Dick Cheney, with, not only you're dealing with the former vice president, you're dealing with the former, you're dealing with the former CEO of Halliburton. Like every, this man has every motivation to be secret. This man, money is no object. And yet, if I can show you where he sleeps, and where he eats, and where he swims, I mean, what can he know about us? I mean, I'm completely self-trained in this. I'm not even, I'm, I'm not even like, a, a, you know, I'm, I'm not even like that, that tech savvy in this. I mean, I just kind of just like duct tape things together to find things, whatever I needed. But uh, what do entire companies and corporations and countries that really have the motivation to dig through our information, what can they get about us? So I'd like to leave you with this, that, you know, we really need to come up with a different idea and a different interpretation and a different meaning of what privacy in the 21st century means. This is no longer, we can, we can no longer afford to use the same definitions of privacy that we used 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 200 years ago or even just five years ago or even just last week. We need to have a much more adaptive and open idea of what this means to us and for each of us this will mean, mean something differently. So I want to leave you with that and thank you very much and uh, I, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you. Welcome. It's a fantastic adventure to be uh, always on the run and, and, and the, at the same time actually yeah, they are running for you now. Or? A little bit. They, they, they come by. You know, we're fr I try to be friends with them. Yeah, that's good. But you know, they're they're actually not that. Uh, they're not very. They're, they they don't like they don't like to be friends. Mm -hmm. They just like they just like to watch from a distance. You think that Dick Cheney um, will um, allow parties at your house because you're, you're yeah. Yeah, we're gonna have a shooting range in the back. That gets good. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's, it'll be it, it'll forward. be a lot of fun. <laughs> Do you have a question? Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, Thank you. you mentioned uh, ways that you are kind of anticipated things that now we kind of take being very common. Is there any way in which your art practice has evolved or responded to having a newer, younger generation of students mm -hmm. year over year in your classes for whom Instagram or selfie sticks might be just second nature to them? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's really interesting watching how uh, people of different generations react to this. Because, you know, I think a lot of it also has to do with the way we communicate. I mean, there was a very specific generation that would write a letter. And then you had a generation that would write, you know, that would call. And then you have 
text, and then you have people that write you over email, and then you have people that will only text you. I mean, we, we're seeing that, I mean, we're, and, and we're actually living in that right now because we actually deal with certain different types of people that only deal with different modes of communication. So I really think in that, it's, it, the interesting thing is though that time is compressed because we've only had people that would communicate in writing for hundreds of years. Then we would have people that only communicated in phone for maybe 30 to 50 maybe a little longer, and then now we only have, the, like in the last five years we've had this, and then now down to like one year. So who knows what the next method will be. But I really think a lot of it has to do with this adaptation. I think a lot of the things really interesting is this idea of like, like migration, and you know, in the whole immigration topics, it's a real hot topic politically right now. But I think we also need to think about this from a, from a digital perspective, because you know, we, turn, we tend to use the word digital native a lot, but we never actually use the word digital immigrant, but yet that's all of us in some way. I mean, very few of us, I mean, there, yes, there, there, are certain, there is a certain generation that is 100% digital from day one, but for most of us, at least of a certain age, we've, we're all digital immigrants. And I think that, that, that type of shift, I think that type of understanding of it, I think it, it has an impact, uh, and particularly in terms of, in terms of uh, dealing with learning and dealing with education, you know, at what point is it a natively learned skill versus a naturalized, uh, a migratory type of a, uh, the action. So, yeah, hopefully that answers what you're talking about, yeah. Do we have another question? Yeah. Yeah, it's just curious if uh, I ever asked you to stop. No, no, there's no law against talking too much. <laughs> Because if there was a law against talking too much, we'd all be in trouble. But you know, but this is interesting because they're very much about, they're, it's very much a one-way uh, direction. They're, they're not about, uh, they, they don't editorialize, they don't provide opinion. They only take information. They ask you questions and they take information. So you could answer them with one word or you could answer them with millions. And I've just decided that I'm gonna keep, keep Talk, keep talking to them. I, I, I'm, I'm a relatively, you know, I think, co cooperative person. I, I, I like to be helpful, you know. But really what it is, is it's really, it's, it's defiance through compliance. It's, it's, this, it's this level of aggressive compliance. And at a certain point, I try to be so helpful that I'm completely not helpful at all. <laughs> so thank you, thank you for the question. Do we <laughs> thank have anything you very else much. Doing? Okay, cool. Is, is there, is there, oh, there's a question from the internet, no. Oh, no, okay, anybody no. else? Okay, great. Is there an FBI agent in yeah, there well, you don't have you, you, a drink, maybe? Yeah, that'd be great, yeah. yeah. Why not? Yeah, so, yeah, so. Do this under us. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's people from some, some government organization at this place, so, you know, let's get a drink later together. Okay, <laughs> let's have one. Thanks. Thank you very much, see you <laughs> Thank guys. Thank you so much. Thanks don't for coming Don't forget out. to help us all to clean this all up. Take